مبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم رب شرح صدري وسلي أمري وهل أقضى المساني أفضل قولي وصلى الله وسلم مبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله All right, cool. Sorry, guys, you're having a little bit of issues with this mic. Um, yeah, maybe that's was one of these. If anybody knows, maybe shorten it too. I don't know if there's a way to do that. So, inshallah, for today, we're going to be, uh, yeah, just like a little bit up here. Yeah, perfect. I know it keeps falling. Yeah. There, that, that'll help, that'll help. Yeah, there we go. JazakAllah khair. Allah bless you. Alhamdulillah. So uh, we'll do a quick recap, inshallah, and then we'll go ahead and dive into our discussion for today. So we're continuing this conversation that we've been having on practical spirituality, and we're going through this text known as the Book of Assistance by Imam Abdullah ibn Alawi al-Haddad. Um, this is the text for anybody who uh, would like to get it, and we might have some extra copies at the, at the mosque. Um, if anyone's interested. So we've been chatting about different things that we can do on a daily level, on a weekly level, or a monthly level to help us improve, practically improve our relationship to uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And really the main thing to keep in mind here is that spirituality is a mainly a consistent amount of things done at a daily level, sometimes that are very, very enjoyable, and sometimes that can get a bit dry but they're done consistently and they make regular, regular impact on someone's heart such that someone then gets closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not something that's like, okay, now just once a month or once a year, someone is going to really get in the zone and then there's no practice outside of that, right? It really has to be consistent. And that's the main point that we've been kind of discussing, right? It's like, what are the different consistent uh, activities, the consistent rituals, the consistent practices that we can get? And these are the most important practices for the believer to be focused on. Uh, the believer should ideally, after getting down their basics, their farad activities, right, they focus on the quality of those and making sure that they have more concentration and we, that we have more depth. And then we focus on the quality or increasing our other supererogatory activities, our nafil activities, right, and, and we start to add more and more to that. So that's kind of what we've been covering. And what all of this will allow us to do is it will allow us to have an increased amount of yaqeen, an increased amount of certainty. And the more certainty that someone has in Allah, the more powerful really your faith becomes. Because you can have various levels of faith, and we've all had different moments of life where our faith feels we feel weak, feel like, you know, I don't really know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, but I don't really, I'm not really sure. Like, my, you, you don't doubt, but it's not necessarily with strong certainty. And then there's people who you meet, who they say they, they have such, strong conviction that all of this is not only real, but that if you do certain things, certain benefits will result. And really the ultimate goal of our spiritual efforts, the ultimate goal of our spiritual efforts is to improve our uh, spiritual yakin. That's really the ultimate goal, right? And it doesn't matter at the end of the day how much um, uh, quantity somebody has the main thing is quality, right? The main thing is quality. And the main thing is your personal relationship with Allah. You don't do it for other people. You don't do it for show. You don't do it because, you know, you want to tell someone, look, oh, look at how much I pray or how much Quran I read or whatever. At the end of the day, none of that matters. It matters that Allah is there. Allah is watching, right? And Allah knows how much effort someone is putting in. Allah knows how sincere someone actually is. And so that's really the main um, the main thing for us to, to keep in mind, right? We don't, we don't do this for people and for you know attention and none of that none of that stuff matters really the only thing that matters at the end of the day is allah says in the quran that it will be a day that neither wealth nor children benefit you and really you can extrapolate that to mean all the things of this world will not benefit you except the one who comes to allah with the qalb salim with a sound heart a sound heart a purified heart that's what's going to benefit the person right and so all of the other things that pull us away from getting a sound heart essentially irrelevant. The debates, the arguments, the uh, problems back and forth between people, mocking people, making fun of people, so on and so forth. All of that comes from a heart that is not yet sound. But a sound heart is a heart which emanates light. And a, 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 a heart that emanates light is a heart then that people, you feel good being around that person. 
or you will be the person who people feel good being around. People feel guided around that person. People feel like that person is uplifting their faith and so on and so forth. Um, and, and, and there was no better example of this, of course, than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he had the purest of hearts and that around him, guidance literally emanated. And so now what we're going through here, all of that is really just, just for us to cover. What we're going through here is we're going through the uh, rituals, the activities, the spiritual exercises that the Prophet ﷺ wanted us to, to do um, and, at a consistent level. So we're going to start today with the uh, how exactly someone should get the most amount of benefit while they're in the mosque, while they're in the masjid. Right? So like literally right now, alhamdulillah, we, are, we're, we have the blessing to be sitting in a masjid. Now, the mosque is known as, the masjid is known as the house of Allah. They are lit, it is one of the houses of God, right? Allah has many, many, many houses of which the masajid are his houses. And then you have the main, what's the, called the Kaaba, right? Which is on earth, this is the house of God on earth for us to worship. It's not like God is literally there, of course. Um, we don't believe that in, in that, but we do believe that this is what, how Allah wants us to worship. And so when you enter into a mosque, there's a lot of secrets now someone opens themselves up to. What does that mean? You're entering into God's house, right? And you can't come if you haven't been invited. And how are you going to go? You can't just force your way into the house. No, God invited us to his house. And you enter into his house. And now there's a certain etiquette that someone has to behave with while they are in his house in order to reap the most amount of spiritual benefit, in order to reap the, um, uh, the most amount of spiritual blessings. And so the Prophet ﷺ, he said that the mosque is the home for all of those who have taqwa. That means that taqwa in this case are God consciousness. If you're mindful of God, right, then you will desire to be in God's mosque. You will desire to be in God's house because uh, in, in the masjid because you are uh, conscious that, oh, this is where I will have access to a significant amount of spiritual blessings. People who have desire for other things, if someone is like really, really desirous, I want to, you know, clothing or cars, they're going to be at the mall or at the, at the car dealer or wherever it is, right? Wherever, wherever thing you love the most is where you're going to spend most of your time or where your heart's going to desire to be, even when you're, when you're not there, right? Someone who is really, really into, you know, certain types of, uh, the, the, their desires have gotten the best of them. They're going to spend more time at the clubs. They're going to spend more time at the bars, right? And you have people who literally would have spent decades in those places and then they convert or they revert to islam and they find islam and then they're spending way more time in, in in the mosques and it's a beautiful thing and that can only happen with allah's assistance it can only happen with allah's assistance but it has an etiquette for someone to get the most amount of blessings and as allah says in the quran that the only the people who attend god's houses are those who believe in allah and the last day that these are the people who will be in allah's in allah's houses that you have to have some type of belief right it's like Otherwise, for someone who doesn't have any belief, it's like, why am I going to, quote unquote, waste my time, right? And you usually see people who have weaker, weaker, weaker belief, or uh, as we know about the, the, the munafiqun, the hypocrites, that they didn't want to spend much time in, in Allah's homes, in Allah's house. Because it's like, what's the point for them, right? I, I can just kick it here. I can do this. I can hang out with my friends. I can hang out with my family. But people who have belief, it's like, no, I actually want to build this relationship with Allah. And that can be done anywhere. But especially, it can be done in, in the houses of, uh, in the in the house of Allah. So there is there are certain um, benefits also to somebody who is attached to the mosque. Among those is that on the day of judgment, which is going to be a very difficult day for uh, for humanity, that on the on the day of judgment is it is not is it not a uh, can't hear. Uh, I think the volume might need to be adjusted in the back. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's good. And so what ends up happening on the day of judgment is it's, it's very, very difficult. And is it better now? A little better. Okay. And so it's, it's difficult. And as a result of that, um, or among the difficulties is that the sun is literally one mile away, roughly from humanity. That means humanity is sweating, humanity is struggling, and there's no shade on that. Like Literally, there's no shade, there's no water, no access to this, except the shade of Allah's throne. And Allah's throne is obviously magnificent, so whoever he wants to put in under that, that the shade of that throne, he'll put. 
among the people who have the shade of God or the, sh the shade of Allah's throne are the people who their, their hearts are attached to the masjid. Their hearts are attached to the mosque. Right? And so that, that doesn't mean you're always present in the mosque. It means that you desire to be in the mosque. Right? And it could mean various, various other things, Allahu Alam. But one of those is that somebody actually has a yearning for the, ma the masjid. Uh, I want to be there. I want to be actually present and I want to be and uh, build my relationship with Allah at the mosque, right? And try to be there for the prayers or for, you know, gatherings or whatever else it is, types of things, you know, um, classes and, and, and iftars and these types of things that will take place, right? That that, that, that is, is present. And so there's manners, right? As we know, and there's etiquettes and that, that will take place. And so among those etiquettes is that somebody has the best manners that they have, they have in the mosque. The mosque is not the place for arguing. It's not the place for being rude. No place is the place for arguing and being rude. But especially when you're in God's house, you don't want to be doing that, right? You want to be in a state of, of mindfulness. You're here to worship. That's the goal. For all the other stuff, we leave, right? It's like, hey, I'm going to go outside and have this conversation or I need to eat, have an argument with somebody or whatever it is. But that's not the place. The mosque is not the place. Unfortunately, in our time today, Muslims, we, we do a lot of other things and a lot of negative conversations will take place such to the point where people will sometimes get aggressive with each other because they disagree on something. That's all from the devil. It's all from shaitan. He wants to make people, uh, he wants to pull them away from each other, right? The second thing is that it is not a place of just fluff conversation, right? Like it's, you know, you know as, as they, the colloquial um, kind of, you know, shoot the ish, like, right? That's not the place. The mosque is not the place, right? It's a place of Someone is going, they're going to, you can ask how someone is doing and, and, and so on and so forth, but it's not the place to like have immense catch-ups about our dunya and how our finances are and so on. And so it's, that's not really the, the, it's like, okay, this is the place from an etiquette point of view. And again, what we're talking about here are higher goals. It doesn't mean all the other things are not allowed. It's just, this is a higher goal to, achieve, to, to, to try to attain to it. Someone is actually saying, hey, how is your relationship with God? How are you doing? How's your iman? How, uh, you know, how is your family and so on and so forth. These are all good questions to have and to ask, but like, you know, to have a deep conversation about business and business transactions. And what, I remember one time, like, is in, you know, in a mosque and someone was like starting to talk to me about, like, you know, we really should invest in silver and all the benefits of investing in silver. And I was just like, okay, thanks for the intel, but that's not really, this isn't the place for us to have a deep conversation about the, the need to invest in silver. Um, that can be done at any point in, in other places, right? Right here, we came to worship God. And let's not remember that. Or let's not forget that. Right? Let's really, really keep that, uh, keep that in mind. And so this is uh, very, very important to, to keep in mind. And the other thing is, ideally, we make the intention that while we're in the mosque to focus on worshiping God, right? That's, that's the point. We come here to pray. We come here to build community as well, especially in where we live. Um, in the West, but there is an ideal emphasis on worshiping Allah in his, in his home. So it is, the masjid is the place of sajda. That's why that's, it's the same root there, right? That sajda is to prostrate to God. And so the masjid is literally the place where one will prostrate. And you come and you express your needs before Allah and you worship Allah and you build that deeper connection. And that can be done again outside of the masjid as well. Um, but spe specifically, that is the, the, the one of the main goals of the masjid. So those three things, right? Someone has good manners, refrain from idle talk and argumentation and so on. And third is to really, really um, uh, utilize as much of the time as possible uh, to worship Allah. And then there's the very, very practical, again, um, elements of this, right? Where there's a dua that everybody should say when entering the masjid. This is from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, that the dua is, Bismillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Allahumma aftah li abwabi rahmatika. Where you are asking Allah, you are first of all saying in the name of Allah. Then you send salutations upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Always good to begin everything with sending salutations upon him because had it not been for him, you and I wouldn't know about Allah. We wouldn't know about Islam, right? The Prophet sallallahu is the he is our messenger, uh, and he is the means for guidance for for the Muslim. And then you say, Allahumma, oh Allah, we ask that you open the doors of mercy for us. Open the doors of mercy, the gates of mercy, or the doors of mercy. It's an amazing, amazing dua that when you enter, you're mindful. And as we mentioned last time, when you enter good places, you enter with the right foot. And when you enter bad places, you enter with the left foot. So you enter the good places with the right foot, 
and you say Allah Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah Allahumma aftah li abu rahmatika if someone does not know or cannot learn the Arabic or is just learning about these things then at least at minimum you try to do that that meaning in English and work your way work our way towards learning the the supplication and the dua in Arabic the second thing to do is that when you come in, ideally, we try to pray two rakahs of prayer, two units of prayer. This is known as the visitation prayer for the masjid, right? It's known as the visitation prayer for the masjid, where you're just coming in and you're offering two rakah of, uh, with the intention of uh, visitation of the masjid, basically. Now, there are instances when someone won't be able to do this, right? There are times when it's forbidden to pray where someone wouldn't do this. Forbidden meaning that if, if uh, the sun is on its way setting, right? Let's say someone comes in before Maghrib, maybe 10 minutes before the, the, the sunset, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Sun is already setting. It's forbidden in Islam to pray when the sun is setting. It's also forbidden to be praying when the sun is actively rising, um, the Prophet Islam told us. And there's different opinion in the, among the scholars, but this is like generally speaking, right? Um, otherwise, most times it's, it's generally fine. And so what somebody would do in this instance is to pray the two rakat. Now, there are other prayers which overtake this. Someone has makeup prayers to do. They don't spend time doing extra prayers. They spend time on their makeup prayers. What does that mean? Five, three years, five years, ten years. Somebody was Muslim, but never, but just didn't pray. Didn't pray, or like they prayed half their prayers, but they didn't pray the others. Because maybe just lazy or whatever else it is. That would take precedent over these types of things. So someone would not do the visitation prayer. They would ideally go and do their makeup prayers, right? If they have whatever makeup prayers that they have to take, uh, that they have to make up. But otherwise, in most instances, this is something that we should that we should do. If someone cannot do it for some other reason, someone should say four times, Subhanallah, Walhamdulillah, Walla ilaha illallah, Wallahu Akbar. Someone would praise Allah and you say, Glory be to Allah, praise be due to Allah. Uh, and that there's no deity worthy of worship except Allah, and Allah is the greatest. So you glorify Allah. The goal, of course, is this glorification and magnification of which the first, the preference is to express it in the prayer, and otherwise to express it via this, um, this, uh, this, this sticker that we just said, right? And then you go about con conduct in the mosque. You know, usually people are coming to pray one of the farth prayers. The other, the other time that this, you would not do this is if there is a prayer that, uh, is going on. Obviously, if there's a farth prayer going on, you join the farth prayer. If the farth prayer is about to start, you join that, um, and, and so on. If you have to pray the sunnah before the farth, and you don't have time to do both, you would pray the sunnah before the farth in, in that instance, because it's a higher rank prayer. Right? And so these are, again, these are like, sometimes these come across as little things, right? We're like, okay, these are very, but these are consistent. These, some, th someone might visit a, a, a mosque, a masjid, multiple times a week or multiple times a month. And then multiple, many, many, many times a year. And so these can, and then many times in their lifetime. These are things if we learn, every time we visit, we get a lot of benefit, a lot of spiritual blessing. We maximize the time that we're there, right? We maximize the time we're there. Someone is going to meet with their, let's say someone is meeting with their, their the CEO of their company. And they're told, they'll come to my house, you know, meet me at my house. People will put on their absolute best clothing, and make sure that they look nice and make sure that they uh, have a pleasant scent and make sure they haven't eaten onions and so on. And then they will go and have that meeting and that conversation, right? And yet sometimes we have a very different etiquette for what it is when Allah is inviting us to his home, right? And we just like, there's one thing if we just don't have the capacity or we're just not there yet. But generally speaking, we try to put in a little bit more effort that, you know, I'm going to God's house, right? I'm going to God's house and I want to make sure that I'm not um, coming in a, in, in a way or having conversations there in a way that would not be pleasing to the owner of that, to the owner of that house. Uh, now there's a whole different side of this when someone is doing da'wah and in, inviting people to Islam, right? Because when you're inviting people to Islam, someone is either new into Islam or someone is kind of prospectively looking into Islam, the etiquettes are different. They don't know, right? So it's like, hey, it's very, very different. You, you do not hold them to the same level of standard and the same types of conversations and the same manners and so on and so forth because they're still we're still all on that journey of learning but this is the where we want to aspire to if that makes sense and then somebody would when leaving we would leave with our which foot left foot and there's also a prayer which to do and these should be ideally 
for those who frequent the, the, the masajid, we should memorize these, right? So you leave with the, um, and you say that, Bismillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah. Bismillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah. Allahumma. Hold on. Uh, Okay, so you say Bismillah wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah a'udhu billah min shaytani rajim wa junudeh. That I seek Allah's protection against shaytan, right? Allahumma inna as'aluka min fadlik. That, oh Allah, um, that assist us with your favor. Assist us with your favor. So there's a couple of narrations. The one I actually learned is different than the one that's listed here, which is why I was hesitating. Um, but in general, few different du'as that one can say while leaving the masjid. The main thing is that you bismillah and then you, you say, send blessings upon the Prophet Sallam and you, um, that you seek Allah's protection against the devil and that you ask Allah to open up uh, his doors of grace to you, right? As you're leaving now, you're in a certain state of protection, leaving that state and you want Allah's special protection um, as well. Alhamdulillah. All right, so that is the, the kind of the main thing. And then the, other, the only other thing is when you enter, right, you'll enter usually at times where people are calling the adhan. And the adhan is the call to prayer, right? Allah is calling. Uh, it's what Allah wants us to use to call the believers to pray. So when the adhan is going on, there's a couple of etiquettes as well. First etiquette is somebody repeats after the adhan and remains silent. Adhan is not the time. Like someone's should, idea we shouldn't be on the phone when the adhan is going off. We should not be talking to other people, whispering to them. The Adhan is a time when the call to prayer is being made and there's a high magnification and alima of the Adhan, right? And the second thing is someone should, we should repeat after the Adhan. So you say, for all of the phrases of the Adhan, you repeat, say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, you repeat after the phrase. Until someone gets to Hayya uh, al and when somebody gets to Hayya al and Hayya al-Fala, you say, La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. That Allah is saying, come to prayer and come to success. Hayya al means come to prayer. And Hayya al-Fala means come to success. And you say at that moment, you don't you, you say, La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. That there's no strength nor power. Only Allah can assist you and me in coming to prayer or in having that success, right? The amazing thing is that these are not just rituals that we do because um, we're just kind of repeating them like parrots. That's not the point. The point is somebody really deeply gets to a point where they're like, what does this actually mean? If you reflect on every word, the reason why we repeat it is also so you can reflect upon it. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. You leave the worries of your life behind. Allah is greater than all those worries, right? And then you say, I declare there's no God except Allah. And you, shadu an la ilaha illallah. And so you, negate everything in your life, in your heart, that might be getting in the way of worship of Allah. And then you testify that by, uh, on the uh, fact that the Prophet is his messenger. And so now you remind yourself on the importance of following the sunnah of the Prophet and the example of the Prophet right? And then you call, Allah is calling us to prayer, right? And you remember the importance of prayer and that only Allah can assist us in getting there. And then Allah is calling to success, to falah. Success in this life and the next. There is no way to have real success in this world or the next without the prayer. All the other success that people have for those who, that, that, that success doesn't amount to much in reality. Remember, this is about reality. What the reality is, is what the angels here are recording. That's reality. It's not about the bank accounts. It's not about the cars. It's not about the CEOs and the presidents. And it's not, that doesn't matter. It's all that's all ephemeral. It's all going to go away. It's in reality is what's actually going to be there for your, uh, for our uh, book, that uh, in our book, right? And that is what we have to focus on. And so, Hayyal al-Fala means success in this world and the next, inshallah. And then, again, you, uh, that you mentioned the greatness of Allah, and then you again testify that there is no God except Allah. What does that mean? Again, it's one is negating all of the things that have entered the heart. You're preparing yourself for the prayer. You and I are preparing ourselves for the prayer. And the Prophet Sallallahu he taught us a dua that after the adhan is done, you, um, you do the dua. Allahumma rabba hada 
هذه الدعوة التامة والصلاة القائمة هذه سيدنا هذه سيدنا محمد الوسيلة والفديلة وبعث مقام مقاما محمود التي وعدته that oh Allah you are the Lord of this adhan this call and this prayer give the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the intercession and superiority and resurrect him to a praiseworthy rank as you have promised him as we as as uh, we are taught that the Prophet ﷺ on the Day of Judgment will have will give will be given this maqam al mahmud this praiseworthy station, where he will be the only one who will be allowed to ask Allah to begin the Day of Judgment. That's his rank. The the human beings will go to to most of the other pro prophets, many of the other prophets, to the Prophet Adam. He'll say nafsi nafsi to the Prophet Noah. He'll say myself myself. I don't have this is not this is not my place because the human human being will be they'll be tired they'll be sweaty. They'll be thirsty, they'll be struggling, and they'll want the Day of Judgment to begin. Then they'll go to Moses, alayhi salam. Then they'll go to, and they'll eventually go to get, uh, make their way to Isa, to Jesus, peace be upon him. And Jesus will say, this is the rank of Ahmad. This is the rank of, um, uh, this is the rank of, of Ahmad, which is the name of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the next life. And then they'll go to the Prophet sallallahu and he will say, yes, this is my, this is my, Love, you know, call, and then he will be inspired to make a certain dua that nobody has ever been inspired to make a certain prayer, and then the day of judgment starts, and he is given the highest station, Maqam al Mahmud on that day, and he will be the intercede for people, right? So the connection to the Prophet is very important because you and I can make some big mistakes, but on the day of judgment we go to the Prophet and we say, "You are our Prophet. Help me, help me out," and he will advocate on your behalf. To Allah and say, Ya Allah, forgive him, forgive her. They did their best, right? This is the dua that you are making. This is why following the sunnah of the Prophet is so important because people who love him and who follow his sunnah and who do a lot of salawat upon him will be very close to him on that day, inshallah. And we'll have this, that special dynamic. And then the, there is the dua that somebody makes. Um, uh, between the aqama, the, between the adhan and the aqama, and this dua is accepted as we as is known in the hadith. So you have the adhan completed, and then you'll do the aqama. The aqama is what you do before the prayer actually begins, right? And the, the Prophet ﷺ told us that in between the two to make dua, right? So ideally, you just sit, and this is again not a time for conversations. It's a time for your conversation with Allah, though. You just sit, you make dua, you say, Ya Allah, I need this. Please help me with this. Forgive me. One of the most comprehensive du'as that he recommends here is saying is, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-afiyah fi dunya wal akhirah. That, oh Allah, I ask you for complete well-being in this world and the next. It's a good thing to do often is to pray for afiyah. Afiyah is well-being, meaning complete health, financial stability, protection, mental stability, all the types of things you could think of but that, that, that would be encompassed in as somebody who is. Uh, in a state of well-being, alhamdulillah. And so, those are the main things um, to, to to consider, right? When somebody is entering into the into the masjid, I will pause there. If anybody has any questions that they might want to ask, yeah. Yeah, yeah, good question. So the question is on making a prayer. So how do you do it? So if you miss a prayer, you you have you do the full prayer again, right? So if you miss dhuhr, you do four rakats of dhuhr, right? In the same way you would have done it. But your intention is just that for a qada, a uh, makeup prayer, right? That's the intention that you make. Um, if you have a fajr though, and you have to make up a fajr, then you do the two rakats. So what I was saying, in, instead of doing the two rakats of the in, of the visitation prayer, someone would do whether it's four rakahs of dhuhr, three rakahs of maghrib, two rakahs of fajr. But if somebody has makeups to do, the makeups take priority, right? Versus this extra prayer that's not really as critical, uh, the makeups would take priority. Yeah. Yes. Uh, good question. So the question was that um, 
is it is it not good to make up prayers or is it, is it prohibited to make up prayers during uh, the time right before Maghrib or the time um, after Fajr? So there is there is difference of opinion on this um, in that make up prayers are emphasized to the point where even in the makru times and the dislike times, you're, it's okay for someone to make them up. Allah knows best. I don't know the act, the kind of exact answer. The advice, the general advice I would give that I've heard is to try to make them up. So like after Fajr, you would be okay, right? After Fajr, you would be to, to do makeup prayers. You would be okay because those are so critical. If it's literally right before, right at the time of sunrise, right? Like let's say sunrise right now, 720, like you could stop 710 to 720. It probably doesn't make sense to do much, right? If that makes sense. To do to do the prayers, to do the makeup prayers, because you're literally doing it as the sun is rising, and that's the time where it's it's best to be avoided. Um, but if even if you were to do so, there are opinions that believe that would allow you to do so. At the time right before Maghrib, it's probably not best to do so. But you are allowed to if it's makeup prayers, right? Because they're so 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 critical. Um, but it's 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 if someone can do so beforehand, right, hour before or so, it, it's preferred. Does that make sense? No, no, you should pray those times for sure. So if someone is late for now, we're talking here. So the time of Asr is up until the minute Maghrib comes in. Okay. The time of Fajr is up until the sun starts to rise. So you have to make. Let's say somebody wakes up like five minutes do possible and to stand for the prayer and to ideally have already been in the rock before any, before the sun starts rising. Right. And then you would complete it. The, goal, the ideal thing, though, is you should be the prayer should be complete before the sun rises, right? Um, and if somebody, let's say, got really delayed, especially in the days where days are short, and is about to miss Asr, and they have like two minutes before the sun sets, same thing. You just got to pray, right? Because uh, the prayer is still in its time, if that makes sense. Uh, you are not qada until you're not delayed until you literally missed it. What we're referring to right now, makeup is like, like making up from years of, of prayers or let's say like all of three three weeks ago someone just like had a tough time and they didn't do any prayers now you got to make all those up right and you just work your way towards those that that's what we mean right um if that makes sense yeah does that is that an answer to question cool. any other questions on this i think okay Alhamdulillah. Let's see if there's any questions that have come in online one second here We can, someone said, we can, can we make dua during the sujood? Yeah, you can make dua during sajda. It's a good time to make dua. So um, when you are literally in the prostration, it's a good time to make dua. But your dua, at the, in, in anything in the prayer has to be in Arabic. So if it's in your mind, right, you're making dua in your mind, that's one thing. And you're like, yeah, Allah, help me with this sickness and this difficulty and this problem. But you don't articulate that out loud in English in the prayer. You can finish the prayer, right? And then you raise your hands up in whatever language you want and you make that dua. But in the prayer, the articulation while you're in sajda cannot be in another language, right? So you're not going to be like, oh Allah, help me here, help me here while you are in the sajda. Does that, hope, does that hopefully that makes sense? Um, that would be done in Arabic. And so the best thing is you do subhanahu rabbi al-a'la and then the dua in your minds, in our mind, um, if it's in another language. Right, versus actually moving the tongue in a different language. What if the person wakes up after sunrise? What about Fajr Salah? So if someone wakes up after sunrise, then you wait 12, roughly 12 minutes till the sun has actually reached its, its a, a decent rising point, and then you make up the Fajr. Right? So if someone wakes up, let's say, at 721, and the sun just rose at 720, wait till like, you know, go make wudu, and then you pray qada, fajr. And then you should also, this is not required, but it's good etiquette to pray two extra raka of asking Allah's forgiveness. That, ya Allah, I'm sorry I delayed it. Like, I missed it, right? It's, it's, as somebody becomes more and more refined spiritually and closer and closer, you start to, every little thing becomes much more weighty. 
every little thing becomes much more weighty, right? Someone is like, how could I miss? So there's, there's people who for 40 years, they've never missed a single prayer, let alone not even missed it. They haven't missed a prayer in the masjid, in jama'ah with the takbir to ihram, meaning they caught the first Allahu Akbar takbir. Like there's people who have, who are really, 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 point. so for them, let's just say, if they were to miss a prayer, I would imagine that person would be doing, would be giving away a lot of money in charity, asking Allah for forgiveness, would be uh, begging Allah's forgiveness for missing the prayer. Would that somebody is in a state of presence? That's the main thing, right? You are present, and when if the akama is happening, that someone actively realizes that they are about to stand in front of Allah. They are already standing, and now they're about to enter into the prayer. Um, so, among the etiquettes would be to avoid fidgeting. Someone should obviously not be like on their phone. Uh, it's not a time for conversation and joking in between people. Um, there's usually not, not, not conversation that the imam ideally should be having after the ikama. And uh, the main thing to bring to heart is when, when you're saying katkama this salat, that and the prayer is established. You are literally establishing the prayer. The more weighty one makes the prayer for them, the more weighty, inshallah, the benefit will be. Remember, you and I are rewarded not only according to if we completed the prayer, how quality, how much quality was in the prayer? How much quality, how focused were we with Allah when we were actually praying? That's very, very important to keep in mind. It's very difficult, very difficult to have focus in the prayer. It's possible. It's very difficult though. With everything we have in our minds going on, all of the issues with our lives and our families, children, work, and so on and so forth, that to just be completely focused and to realize the meanings that one is uh, reciting it's not it's not easy so you ideally start that with the iqama that you established presence i am about to stand before allah try to focus right and then you enter into the prayer among the editors with the first allahu akbar you literally toss out or literally tossing out everything out of your mind except the focus of allah that's one of the intentions to make when someone is doing allahu akbar you literally make this motion and you literally or like they make that type of motion where everything is, is no longer present except the one whom you are standing before that we are standing before. As we know, the Prophet said, one of the signs of ihsan, of spiritual excellence, is to worship Allah as though we see him. But if we don't see him, know that he sees us. So a very, very important sign of spiritual excellence um, to keep that in mind. Alhamdulillah. Does anybody have any other um, questions here on this topic? We missed a couple here. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Questions, questions? Alhamdulillah. So, so inshallah, with regards to the rest of the classes, so we will, we will not have class next week, and we also will not have class the following week. Um, so a lot of people are traveling and holiday and so on and so forth, and so uh, no class on the week of December 26th, 27th, uh, which would have been December 29th would have been the Wednesday, and then no class on January 5th. We'll resume, inshallah, January uh, 12th. Or resume inshallah January twelfth. So just ask that for anybody who is, you know, traveling. You know, make sure inshallah Allah give you safe travels. And uh, if you come, if you are traveling and you are of course not feeling well after the travels, to stay home and to watch and via the live stream, um, and then to to come to the masjid. Of course, when we're feeling better, is given this whole you know COVID situation. Um, but but inshallah we'll resume then. And the the main thing to focus on when we have some slow time is to implement. Implementation is everything. Knowledge is useless if it's just information in the head. It doesn't mean anything. It's just facts, facts and figures. It's all about implementation. How much etiquette will someone have? How much character will someone improve? How, many, how much worship is someone going to be able to do? How much quality is going to enter their worship? How much focus does someone have on building their relationship with Allah and their yaqeen? Implementation, right? So that would be my advice to myself and all of us is that as we have time, and as we get slow periods of time, that that's a time to relax, but it's a time to also implement what we've been learning, right? Implement what we have been, what we've been learning. And inshallah, if we do that, we will get immense, immense, immense special assistance from, from Allah, uh, inshallah. Someone says, any advice, uh, people trying to subtly make changes into the religion, like celebration of Christmas, etc. Um, for somebody who does not, so the question is like, I think it's around people who are Muslims and actively going out of their way to try to celebrate Christmas, right? There's two situations in this instance. One is someone has a family, they're not, they're they, they're Muslim, they've converted to Islam, 
their whole family celebrates Christmas and they want to partake in that. It's very, very different than someone's Muslim, their whole family's Muslim, and someone's just trying to do the whole Christmas thing. In the first situation, you got to, everybody has to figure out what's going to work for them. What balance does someone have? Everybody in their family is inviting them to dinner and so on and so forth. And they want to build that, those family ties and that's their intention. But they're not actively associating a religious intention with that, with that, with the holiday. That would be considered fine. Um, but it's, but it's as long as that religious association is not there, right? Because if somebody's like, Hey, my whole family is gathering together. I'm literally not going to have a chance. And they're, they're a convert to Islam. Their rest of their family is not Muslim. To build that relationship the more of the problem comes when someone is a muslim and they're like hey and the whole family's muslim I, I like the tree i like the lights i like all this stuff and that would not, that's not permissible for us to do that that is considered um and there's quite a few reasons for this one is uh we do not we are not supposed to innovate into our religion right so we're not supposed to add in things that are not part of our tradition number one um as we know that the innovation is a very, very strict concept. And so the innovations that we talked about earlier on, on the idea of good innovations, right? Let's say a good innovation is the introduction of the clock to tell you what time it is to pray. Because very Prophet Islam didn't use that. He used the sun, right? But you would not put Christmas and, and so on and into that in that category. That would not fall un, under it. Um, the second thing to keep in mind is that Somebody has to make sure that they do not imitate the fault, the practices of people of other religions. That's, that's not permissible for us to do. To imitate the practices of, in this case, the Christians, right? And you can have love for Christians, so on and so forth, but does, you just don't have to imitate their practice. So we should not imitate these practices. Um, that would be the second thing. And uh, the third thing to keep in mind is that you, you and I have to have a defined boundary at some point, right? The boundary has to be there. If Muslims decided, Hey, I like this and I like that. And I don't like this and I don't like that. I like Kwanzaa. I like Christmas. I like Hanukkah. I like, you know, I'm not really feeling Eid. Like you, you, you make up your own religion at that point, right? But Allah is already defined. And Allah says that, uh, that this is the day he has perfected for you the religion. He revealed this ayah in Surah Ma'idah, I believe. That the, the religion of Islam is already perfect. Had Allah wanted us to be doing this, he would have just told us, hey, you should do this. And would have gave the Prophet would have had a hadith about the tree and would have had, would have told us to celebrate. But that's not that's not the way of the Muslim. Now, if somebody is doing that, it's not our job. Remember, there's a place for everybody. It's not our job to go and to harshly be like you, you know, call them names. Don't you know this is haram? That's not the way to do so. And don't you know it's prohibited? Somebody should ideally say, hey, look, if you are in a place to actually be giving advice, to say, hey. You know, we probably shouldn't be doing this. Probably not the best thing to do. But usually someone who is practi uh, practicing Christmas and celebrating, the, the faith is already weak in some way or another many times, right? Because otherwise, you wouldn't need to go outside of the tradition. If somebody's faith is strong, there's everything is in Islam. Everything is with Allah and His Messenger. You don't need to go outside. But usually, if someone is bringing in things from outside, it's because something's off anyways. And in that case, you have to be very careful. Don't push them away further. It's not the end of the world if someone is doing that. Do not be the person who pushes them away. If you are not, if you and me are not knowledgeable people who are in that position, who actually understand the intricacies of how to enjoin good and forbid evil and have conversations, it's not our business. People do what they need to do. Someone knows how to tactfully, with the sunnah, give advice while being merciful and praying for them as well, that Ya Allah, assist them and trying to help them, right? And not so they can be arrogant and be right and make them feel wrong. A lot of etiquettes that are required here and a lot of, 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 of uh, tactfulness, then they're in the place where they can go and they can gently advise somebody, hey, probably shouldn't be doing this. Um, but that, that's, not, that's not everybody's place and that's something to keep in mind. So hopefully that answers the, the question. Um, uh, would you say about uh, birthdays? Yeah, birthdays, most of the, many of the scholars have said that as long as someone is using the day of birth to reflect on their life and to... Um, to reflect on their life and to uh, take take a lesson from that that they have gained another year alhamdulillah it's it's totally fine um that you and i are not uh going out of our way you know if, but if somebody wants to have gifts and so on and so forth many of the scholars have permitted that it's not really like that 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 the same as christmas yes
it's a good question. And the question was that about Muslim going into uh, into church, um, and if somebody you know has a family member or so on that's taking them with them. Uh, so I need to look into that. I don't don't know the answer off the top of my head. Um, there is a uh, that actually going into the church is not haram, from my understanding, right? That that Sayyidina Omar radiallahu an he went into the church when he went into Jerusalem, right? And he went into the church where um, in, in, in Bethlehem itself, right? Like one of the most critical churches of Christianity. Uh, but to associate in their acts of worship, that can become potentially problematic. This is what it's be, it can be very, very different depending on the situation. Context is really, really, really important in religion. It's always hard to have a blanket ruling, right? And the reason why I say context is important, if you, one example of this is that, um, I, we just went through a whole discussion on prayer not being allowed or ideal to do at a specific time. But if someone were to make the statement, prayer is not allowed, that would be a wrong statement. But in the context, it's the right statement, right? And so the reason I'm saying the context is because you mentioned a very specific family instance where it's your father and you are, um, you know, and he's Christian and, and going into that situation. And so um, let me look into that, inshallah, and just, just if you could follow up with me next time, uh, definitely will do my best to have to have an answer. It's not recommended in general, though, that like Muslims are going to you know Sunday uh, service and mass and um, and and synagogues and going into their service. That's not generally recommended for us to do. Yeah, that would not be good for us to I to go out of our way to seek that. But again, the context becomes very different when you have a parent involved in that. Yeah, go ahead. Right. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Right. This is again where intention becomes very, very important. Right? The question was, you know, that someone has an elderly uh, grandmother and that, you know, she she appreciates it and you maybe your intention is to help her and to assist her and to bring happiness to her. Um, it's where it becomes very dependent on the intention and the text, right? Because you are not necessarily going out of your way to do it as a form of worship and you are not going to do it as a form of uh, following the practice, you're literally going to assist your grandmother of who also has a right over you. So again, the context is important. Let me, but I'll look into this one, inshallah. Yeah, um, if that makes sense. Okay, just one other question. Let's see. Okay. Uh, so now. Alhamdulillah. I think that answers most of the questions. Inshallah. So we'll go ahead and, and end here uh, now that we're at time anyways, and we'll, we'll proceed to pray Isha. We'll do a short short du'a. So just again, no class next week, no class the following week. We'll resume again on January the 12th. Yes, Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much. Um, Alhamdulillah. And we'll continue with it. And then I think just we're about halfway through and we'll be trying to consolidate a little bit so we can get through. Inshallah. Um, if anybody has any feedback on ways we're doing things differently or better, also just please come up after and let me know. Yes. Yeah, so the book is called The Book of Assistance, mm -hmm. and the author is Imam Al A L Haddad. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, Imam, I M A M A L Al Haddad. H A D as in dog. <laughs> D. Uh, a D Haddad. I'm trying to think of a different word. Yeah. Haddad, exactly. Yeah. So that the book of assistance, excellent, excellent book. Literally, this book, if somebody were to implement everything in here and just use this as a manual, right? Because it's extracted from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet, and literally implement it and do what he's saying with regards to praying and building dhikr and, and 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 making a relation with Quran and so on and so forth, we would be set to achieve the highest stations possible in nearness to Allah. Like literally it is a manual to achieve not just, we're not just talking now at this point about being a believer, we're talking about this is this is literally a path to sainthood. We have a concept of sainthood, very big concept of sainthood in our tradition called being a wali. And to be a wali, this is this is what he's outlining in the book. Um, so that's why sometimes the stuff might seem like, oh, this is small, this is small, this is small, but all the small stuff adds up. And it's all critical in the path of 
uh, in the path of sainthood uh, or in the path of Islam. Okay, we'll go ahead and end. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Sallallahu wa sallam wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirat hasanatan wa kina adab al-nar. Rabbana taqabal minna innak anta samiyul alitubal innak anta tawab al-Rahim. La ilaha illa anta subhanak inni kuntu min al-dhalimeen. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Kareem, Ya Allah, we ask Ya Allah that you accept from us and that you pardon us and that you forgive us and that you overlook our mistakes and that you relieve our our problems and that you assist us with our anxieties and that you cure our sicknesses and that you cure our worries, Ya Arham Rahim, and assist us in all of the issues that we are facing, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, and we ask Ya Allah, and we thank you for all the blessings that you have given us. We ask that you pardon our sins and overlook our shortcomings and assist us in every aspect of our life. And we ask you for everything good the Prophet Islam asked for. We ask you for protection from everything evil that he asked protection from. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah.